Welcome back to the show. Check out these headlines. We got Uphold It, Apex, Swift, Ripple, Breaking Partner News. Oh my gracious, gracious. Brad Garlinghouse and David Schwartz on stable coins and the market. And guess what else? Warships. Oh, we're getting into all of it today. Somebody rolled that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and DickPerspectives.com for exclusive content. Right now, $2.57 trillion market cap for crypto. The market is off 3.4%. $67,400-plus for Bitcoin, $3,500-plus for Ethereum, and $112 billion-plus market cap for USD Tether at the moment. USDC is at $32 billion plus, and XRP is at $0.48. Cents. We're off by one8 on the 24, off by 7.4 on the 7-day. Much of the market is bleeding right now ladies and gentlemen but i'm super excited to see where ripple and the real u.s digital dollar is going to sit on this chart sometime likely before the end of this year oh my oh my super excited Range of price very quickly between 49 and 50 cents. We'll keep an eye on it. Hey, I want to remind you guys, I Trust Capital is not only the best gold, crypto, uh, silver IRAs on the planet, but check it out. Look, I don't know. A lot of people don't know this. 401k, people think, oh, you know, I put tax-free in my 401k, and then when I can get into it, when I'm old enough, I'll just have all this tax-free money. You don't. You can save tax-free, but when you go to take it out after you're able to take it out, you're going to get taxed. But that's not what happens with Roths, okay? And that's why you can roll your 401k over. Why would you want to wait 20 years to draw on your 401k to get taxed again? I don't know. But look, <laughs> or to get taxed, not again, but to get taxed. I don't listen. Click the link below. Contact iTrust if you don't believe me. They'll tell you. They'll help you. You can roll your 401k, your 403b, your 457, or just open up an account and get started and have more empowerment in your retirement and your future than anywhere else on the planet. That's why it matters so much. Click the link below and check it out. Now let's set the tone here because this was at Apex. Shout out to Brad Garlinghouse and David Schwartz. Uh, we're going to hear here uh, about the case and how Ripple was targeted first. Let's set that tone. Look, I think as you reflect on the last handful of years, we'll call it four or five years, there are things that are super frustrating. You know, why did the SEC go after XRP kind of first, if you will? Uh, you know, in some ways you look at that now and you say, we're almost at the very, very end of that journey. I think that, you know, hopefully we have resolution. Uh, we, we can't control that now. The judge, you know, will make the decision when she makes the decision. I, my estimation is sometimes in, sometime before the end of the summer, somebody asked me, is that the end of August? I pointed mm -hmm. out that September 21st is the end of summer. <laughs> so I don't know, sometimes there. I think my birthday, August 28th, that's the end of but summer. You know what? Yeah. I'll ask her if we can celebrate your birthday with that. That would be, <laughs> yeah. we'll all celebrate with you. We'll call the judge. But look, it, it has been frustrating. It, what has been exciting is the momentum that has been building. I mean, look, there are three times as many people here as the last Apex. This community is more active, more vibrant, more entrepreneurial. I mean, it's just awesome. Like, I, I see the momentum and the excitement here, and it's just very palpable. The U.S. market remains, frankly, a laggard. You know, uh, the U.S. regulatory environment, even though Ripple is at the tail end of that, and, and I think it's strange to me that XRP is in such a unique position and that the market hasn't kind of rewarded that. XRP in the US is one of the few things we can say definitively is not a security. With ETH, I don't know how that's going to play out, right? Apparently Wells notices, which is the SEC kind of pre-warning that we're going to file a lawsuit, have been gone out to consensus, well, purportedly as I've read, maybe on your side as well, to consensus. Uh, you know, we know the Ethereum Foundation has received various inquiries. So, look, it's super frustrating. And even, even it's not just the SEC. The United States kind of current administration uh, with Gary Gensler as the head of the SEC has been pretty hostile towards crypto. But, look, you asked the macro question. That has been frustrating. I think we're on the other, largely on the other side of that. And it's the reason why I'm so excited. And I, 
hearing David talk about what's going on in the XRP ledger, I look at the next five years and what this community may look like five years from now, and I get very excited about it. Mm. David, what does that look like from the perspective of client engagement and, and the penetration? And there you have it. Look, I wanted you to hear that as we set the tone for where we're going today. I got to go to Stuart Alderati and him highlighting here the Dow Quan and Terraform Labs have agreed to pay the SEC a combined $4.5 billion in to settle the civil fraud case against them. The settlement would also ban Quan and Terraform from buying or selling crypto asset securities. Now, uh, Stuart shared this and says this SEC is again touting a big penalty but the SEC actually will end up a creditor in bankruptcy court, see BlockFi, because that's what happened there. The SEC has become a show regulator chasing headlines rather than good policy. This is exactly why I showed you this, because it really echoes the same thing. Why would you go after Ripple and Sue Ripple when they've been more transparent than everybody? And we've got all these other crap coins out here ripping people off. It's unbelievable. Then there's a reminder, speaking of unbelievable, shout out to Eleanor Terrett here. She reminds all of us that today the SEC, Gary Gensler, and the CFTC, Rostin Benham, will appear before the Senate Appropriations Committee, and this is happening 47 minutes ago, about their proposed 2025 budget request, as the SEC is going to ask for $2.594 billion for 2025. The CFTC is asking for $399 million. Senators will be able to ask policy questions of both chairmen. Now, here's what's interesting, because I've been saying this. This is where it leans into exactly what I've been saying. Government could have stopped Gary Gensler a long time ago on the right and left side of the aisle if they wanted to. But they haven't wanted to, which tells me that the entire government is bought and paid for. Okay. You don't have to believe it. This is just my take on it. And this is why they can't get anything done. This is why I've proposed the idea that, hey, maybe it's maybe Gary Gensler's not a bad guy. Maybe Jay Clayton's not a bad guy because we've all seen him that way. But maybe there's an angle to this where the, 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 the government is so corrupt, potentially, and I do believe this. That in order to get legislation done that the paid for corruptors don't want to see happen, they have to create a legal calamity issue, just like what we're seeing here with blockchain and distributed ledger technology, which threatens one of the largest uh, uh, donors in the world, which is big banks. And maybe they're trying to suppress it through regulatory capture of the SEC, which I certainly believe. ETH gate, free pass, hello. And then there's the other side of this, where... If you create this legal uh, log jam, which is what they've done, it forces Congress to have to put legislation through. And then the right side of the aisle and the left side of the aisle, which have all taken tons of money from the banks, can tell them, our hands are tied. We'd love to be able to continue serving you, but we have to put legislation through. And this has become a real national security issue as well, right? That's the that's kind of where I see it going. Now, this is astounding news, and this is going to tie us back into Apex. So stay with me here. Uh, this is from Mr. Mann pointing out that PIX in Brazil, Ripple has partnered with TravelX Bank in Brazil to launch its on-demand liquidity solution, which aims to capitalize on the growing popularity of PIX payment system by offering faster and cheaper cross-border payments. Now, why am I sharing that with you is because, yes, I'm aware Brad G said ODL is failing, makes, which makes sense. Um, and I don't think ODL is failing. I think it just needs support. At XRP's current evaluation, the fluctuation, uh, why would it be able to serve a global wholesale population? The stablecoin is onboarding mechanism into Web3, where XRP can begin to pick up its pace, capitalize on price stability uh, through the real U.S. dollar. I certainly agree with that. And I'm showing this because we're going to see picks brought up in this conversation at Apex with Nancy Beaton from Uphold. Shout out to you, Nancy. Take a listen. As you mentioned, global presence, you are serving over 10 million customers in 140 different countries. And how do you then ensure that those international users have consistent and reliable experience across all these different markets so that if I'm using Uphold in the US, my experience is very similar to if I were using it in 
UK or Australia or other markets that you serve? Yeah, you know, I would almost say that users don't necessarily want it to be that consistent. Oh, they only want consistency when you're doing something peer to peer, right? I don't want to okay. mess with, you know, how to find you, Yana, and like sending you some crypto. Okay. But if you're in Brazil, you don't want the same experience. You need your local payment rails, oh, okay. right? You need, because getting a credit card to go through in Brazil, near impossible, right? So we actually just launched, we have a fiat to crypto on ramp, Topper. Yep. We just launched PIX. So now we use local payment rails. People can buy crypto like this using their local, local transaction process instead of, you know, maybe what I would force down from the US is a credit card. So I think in some regions, they almost absolutely need it customized by language, by payment processing, by payment methods, some, you know, with off, off ramp, some want to off ramp to a bank, some want to off ramp to, you know, a stable coin. Yep. So it, it almost goes back again, I would say, to what the user wants and how they need it in that market. It does matter consistency when you start to talk about peer to peer. And so we're really going to elevate the ability for um, borderless peer to peer um, transactions that I think will need the consistency you're talking about. There you go. And I'm showing that, look, and we can't forget, too, as Mr. Mann rightfully points out, Ripple and Uphold are partners, and they're very good partners, and they're doing a lot on the back end that takes it takes Uphold to the next level of not having to follow all the speculative retail investor trends. I'm very excited for that partnership. And I'm showing this now here because we're looking at Swift and their transaction manage, manager simulator. And you can see the digital asset network here, right, shown, as you can see all the other different CBDC shown how it plugs into the system. Notice CLS, Trusted Market Solutions here. Now, I want you to stay with me because we're going to some big picture stuff. Shout out to Chad. Uh, HSBC Ripple Custody. Well, this is that same image we're looking at. This is a Swift simulator, right? <laughs> You're looking at it. Here's another breakdown of it here. CLS in the middle of it. But what do we know? Here's what we know. HSBC Swift CBDC. That's what we know. We're tied into the middle of this thing because here's HSBC tied right into the middle of SWIFT. But what do we know? HSBC chose Ripple's Medico for a custody solution. Knee bones collected to the leg, connected to the leg bone, right? I mean, that's what's going on here. HSBC taps Ripple's Medico for launch security token custody. Just saying. That's SWIFT's map. There's HSBC. I'm just saying, right? They're not doing all this because it isn't going to happen. We're all just upset because it ha hadn't happened yet, right? HSBC down here on the other side, too, in case anybody hadn't seen it. But nevertheless, let's keep moving. Let's talk about Ripple Partner news here. Axelar connects to 60-plus blockchains, all the major EVM chains, Layer 2, Cosmos, IBC, and it just happens to be going on right at the time that Ethereum is staring down the barrel being sued by the SEC. Well, I tell you, isn't the timing on this convenient? Let's listen to the clip. So with Axelar... This is something that we've been working on for the last three years. Axler today, as I mentioned, connects to 60 plus blockchains, all the major EVM chains, L2s, as well as the Cosmos IBC chains. And what we're doing with Ripple is something that's incredibly exciting. We're gonna be connecting both XRPL as well as the new EVM sidechain so that they have full interoperability to all of the existing chains on the Axler network. So now imagine a world where you can bridge any asset from these EVM and Cosmos chain to XRPL and the other way back. The XRP can now be available on any of these chains, as well as the tokenized assets, RWAs, that the Ripple team has been uh, busy building. But this is just the beginning. It's a multi-chain world after all. It's a multi-chain world after all. It's a multi-chain world after all. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't know what to say. This is happening. XRP Ledger, I've said it a million times, and we'll say it one more. The XRP Ledger has a decentralized exchange. The world's first ever decentralized exchange, in fact. Now, what's interesting about that is that it's not a world decentralized exchange unless it's plugged into all the chains of the world. It's a multi-chain world after all. You know, and this is where we're going, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. The decentralized exchange isn't anything unless everybody's connected to it. 
Oh, shout out to Axelar and all they're doing to build that bridge. They're going to help all those Ethereum developers get off that chain because it's security. They don't want to get in trouble. You know, like the last few years that XRP Ledger's been experiencing the same issues when they try to get people to build on the ledger. Yeah, Ethereum's coming to that party. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and this in right here from Ripple... Ripple and Archax are expanding their partnership to bring hundreds of millions of dollars in tokenized real, ass, real world assets to the XRP ledger over the next year. Come on in. Archax partners with leading financial institutions to enable tokenization of RWAs. Thanks to the extended collaboration, these institutions will be able to utilize the XRP ledger to tokenize their assets. Our industry is at the start of the next major adoption stage in blockchain blockchain technology will deliver real utility in financial markets at scale. No question about it right there. Marcus and Fang are dropping it like it's hot. Shout out to him. Uh, look, here we have it here. Brad Garlinghouse responding to the news. Very excited about this link up with Ripple and Archax. Financial institutions are increasingly tokenizing their real world assets on layer ones like XRP Ledger through regulated entities like Archax. And I only expect this to grow exponentially in the future. Well said by Brad Garlinghouse. And this is Graham from Archax, who thanks Brad Garlinghouse, looking forward to working together. And this here is David Schwartz talking about the stablecoin market that is going to help everybody work together. Because in order to be able to move all this value around, you're going to need tokenized securities, tokenized commodities, tokenized fiat dollars. And that's exactly what stablecoins are. Take a listen to David Schwartz here. Now, and one of the places where you can see that the most easily, I think, is with stable coins. The current market cap of stable coins is around $160 billion, and it's growing so rapidly that that number is, you know, it's going to be obsolete by, the, you know, in, in months. Uh, it's expected to grow to almost $3 trillion by 2028. And this is the next statistic is, I think, the most important one. Remember, I was talking about bleeding over into popular culture. It's great if everybody in the Bitcoin space thinks Bitcoin's great, if everybody in the crypto space thinks cryptocurrency is going to take over, if everyone in the DeFi space thinks DeFi is going to be the next big thing. What about people outside the space? Listen to this comment. 97% of institutional investors believe that tokenization is going to significantly affect asset management. And those people are not in this space yet. These are people who are not, they're not Bitcoin people, they're not crypto people, they're not blockchain people, they're not DeFi people, they're institutional investors. These are some of the most conservative people in the world. Right? And they are a gatekeeper to trillions and trillions of dollars. Right? And they think that the technologies that we're building are going to revolutionize their industry. That Find a problem and solve it for those 97% of institutions that are coming in here that they got to use it every day and it's going to solve their problem. You do that, you're the next Google. That is that bleed over into popular culture. The market value of tokenized U.S. securities alone is $1.5 billion. This is a new space. So that is going to, I mean, that, that number is good, probably different by the time I get off this stage. And of course, the growth of tokenized assets, $16 trillion forecast by 2030. I, I think that's probably going to be conservative. It just, it just makes sense to get into these spaces. If, the, if DeFi spaces and tokenized spaces are where the investors are going to be or where the money is going to be, that's got to be where the assets are, right? The assets are going to chase the money. He's telling everybody in that audience specifically where to look to solve a problem for your new idea to build on the XRP ledger. He's giving you the point, you know, get in front of this 97% number and figure out how to solve a problem for some or all of them. And you're going to find some success, right? It, it is that simple. It really is that simple. There's no question. And this, again, is our man from Archax right here, Graham Rodford who's going to tell you just how bullish he is on what's going on. He thinks it's a lot bigger than $16 trillion. David did say he felt that that was a, uh, 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 I guess, a, a, moder a modest number. No, no, well, I'm yeah, probably a bit more bullish, um, but I have been for six years and slightly behind my original projections. But the, t the total market is $1.4 quadrillion, everything that's ever out there. And if you start looking across any of those asset classes, 
they're all starting to move on chain already. Um, and the ease with which we've seen people interested in the money market fund, tokenized treasuries and those types of instruments, the support for stable coins. When you're talking about replacing cash, when I see DTCC, Euroclear, Clearstream, you know, it only takes one of them to flip onto natively digital. And that's trillions of assets um, on its own that move. So, you know, tens of trillions, I think we could see. And bearing in mind, it's 1.4 quadrillion. This is still a tiny slice of a huge market, you know, 30 to 50 trillion, all on XRP, all trading on Artex. <laughs> Here we go, $50 trillion. <laughs> yeah, we're going to love that. And I tell you what, that swell 2023, November last year, remarkable. It doesn't mean that Graham is going to be right, but he's optimistic because he understands what's in front of us. And what is in front of us is the entire traditional markets being tokenized. Come on in. Uh, I said that we were going to talk about warships today, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about. And we're going to do that inside of the Freedom Zone, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you will join us at dickperspectives.com. Click the Freedom Zone for next to nothing. Come on in, support the channel. You get all the daily videos on YouTube with zero Google ads. You get extra content as well, a VIP conversation, as well as a VIP Telegram, private Telegram access as well. So this is a pretty remarkable opportunity. And I want to show you right now uh, the Freedom Zone. We're going in and we're going in hard this time. Uh, not financial advice from me or anyone else. I'll catch all of you inside the Freedom Zone. All right, here we are. 